Well, good morning. On this wonderful Palm Sunday, once again, you know we're not able to, to worship together, so um, I'm here to record the sermon for you guys and, and you know, just um, praying for us through this, through this pandemic that, that's going on right now, not being able to get together to worship, but we can worship in our homes and, and we don't have to be here, but you are truly missed. I miss being here every Sunday, you know, and during this, I once again want to challenge you that, to understand that, that we don't have to be at church. We're, we're not the church because of where we go. We're the church because of who we are. And, and the challenge to you is to be that church to the people around you, to be that type of uh, person that they can see Christ in you as you go and help them um, and, and to go out of your way to, to help people. And that's what I, I like to challenge everybody with, you know, and, and it looks like next week we won't be able to get together for, for our Easter service, but understand that, that Easter is just a day. And when we celebrate Christ's resurrection on that day, um, we should be celebrating that every single Sunday. Um, so, so next Sunday, as the services will be canceled, just realize that, that Easter will never be canceled because of what Christ did on the cross. We're in Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 47. We're going to finish up chapter 15 finally after, after quite a, uh, maybe about four or five weeks here of going through 15. Um, but we, we've been in the book of Mark, and, and, and from chapter 11 on is the final week of Jesus, the Passion Week, as, as people like to call it. We saw when Jesus came in um, to Jerusalem triumphantly on that, on that donkey, people um, waving the palm branches and, and putting their cloaks down and, and, and praising him and, and calling him Messiah and Lord. Um, that's what today is. That's Palm Sunday. And Jesus triumphantly came into Jerusalem. But during this, that, this week of, uh, of Jesus' life, his last week, we saw the cleansing of the temple where Jesus went back and, and he said, my, my father's house is a house of prayer. And they made it a, 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 a den for robbers and, and the money changers and all that. We saw how Jesus cleared that temple. We saw that he had teaching times with his disciples and he taught them about the things to come and, and he prophesied the temple being torn down and he prophesied about that he will come back one day and, and, and he talked to them and he taught them those things and, and then as he was having dinner with um, his friends at Simon the leper's house and, and Mary came in and, and anointed his body with that, that perfume, that, that jar of alabaster and, and, and anointed him for the burial that, that was going to come. We see that he got together for that last Passover and he instituted the Lord's Supper with his friends and his disciples as, as they um, had one last time together. He leaves there and he goes to the garden of Gethsemane and, and he prays with the disciples and he talks about um, and, and he prays to his father about taking the cup away from what he's enduring right now but he knows that his mission and what it is. We see that Judas comes and he's betrayed and arrested. He's tried unjustly in front of the Sanhedrin. He's drugged in front of Pilate. And Pilate had the ability to, to let him go. But he was so afraid of the riots and the things that would happen that, that he handed Jesus over to be, to be crucified. He was beaten. He was mocked. He, he, was, he was led to, be, um, to, to the cross and the crucifixion. And, and see, that's where we are today. He is on the cross. He is fulfilling his mission today. And so... Um, I'm tired of the sermon. It is finished. And if you will, please read with me Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 47. And it says, When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Elo, Elo, Lama, Sabbathi, which translates, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, let us, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the less, and Jose, and Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many others, other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. 
when evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, and a, who was a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and some of the centurion who questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And when asserting this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a lion, a lion cloth, took him down, wrapped him in a lion cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of a rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jose was looking on to see where he was laid. Hey, please pray with me. Lord, Heavenly Father, just, um, I come to you right now. Lord, I just uh, lifting up everybody to you today, Lord, as we go through this um, time of difficulty. Uh, Lord, I know it's all in your hands, and you are the one who um, guides and directs us. And Lord, I pray as these words are spoken today that, that it would be your words and not mine. That God, that somehow I could just get out of your way. Lord, I know it's only through your power that I have the ability uh, to be able to stand here and, and to bring these words. God, thank you for what you do in our lives. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. You know, back in the U.S. history, we it, it, it tells us of how the great transcontinental railroad was built. It was it was a time where they wanted to unite the country from the Pacific to the Atlantic um, on one railroad. And they had some difficult times doing this. They they actually ran into some financial problems along the way, but finally, finally they got it done. They laid, they laid the last tie between New Mexico and Colorado, the last rail. It was a very special day. They had that. They, they had special wood where they was going to hammer the spikes into. They had two silver spikes where the governors from New Mexico and, and Colorado was going to get together, and, 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 and there was a lot of fanfare and everything. And when the governors nailed the spikes and they put them into the ground, there was a news flash and, and, and sent all over the uh, the United States are saying that it is finally completed. The, the railroad was finally done, and they and they were able to to transport from one end to the other on railroad. Well, over two thousand years earlier, there were some other spikes that were driven, not to some special wood, but into a cross. They were driven through the the hands and feet of of the Son of God to the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ. They were iron, and they were they were driven in while all of heaven and earth looked. And as he hung there on that cross, as he fulfilled that mission, a, a, a news flash had gone out for something that's been heard around the world, and he said, it is finished. It was the cry of our Savior. Now there's a way open for, for, for us to get to heaven. A uh, 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 means of access to God has finally been completed. Um, our, our sinfulness has, has been reconciled through Jesus Christ as he hung on this cross. Our debt of sin has been paid, and the cost was great. And that's the message that our, our text conveys this morning. And as we look at this text, we see um, it, it, we see that it's it's opposite of the way the world thinks. You know, you, you look at the movies and, and, and you and you see all these great scripts, and, and it's always the hero wins, he defeats the villain and rides off into the sunset. Well, this is different. Rarely ever do you see a hero die in a script. This passage here, you'll never find on the best top ten list of, of the New York Times. Or you'll never see that because of, of the way it went down. It was not the script that the disciples thought was going to happen. They, they, were, they were following Jesus and, and, and they were waiting for him to, to inaugurate his kingdom and, and, and to go into his kingdom. They never thought that, that his kingdom was spiritual, not physical. And the people around him looked at Jesus. They wanted that, that, that Messiah. They wanted the one who was going to free them from the bondage of the Romans, not, not from the sinfulness. They, they misunderstood and the script was not the way it was supposed to be because the hero dies in our text today. But we know for a fact that this is not the closing scene. This is not the end because today what he did, he finished his mission. We're going to see in three days next weekend on Easter, the resurrected Christ who gives us the victory over, over sin and the victory over, over death. And, and we're going to see that, that it, what he brings next week as he as he's defeats Satan and the enemy. And this was not some tragic turning of events that, that Jesus went through. It wasn't something that just happened. It, it, it's what he came to earth for. He came to earth to, to die for ourselves, to be that atonement for our sin. And we're going to look at that today. 
as we dig into the scripture, um, we're, we're going to talk about, about this for a little bit. So verses 33 through 36 here in chapter 15, it says, When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Elo, Elo, Lama Sabbathakankin, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. Some ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. So here's the timeline. Okay, 9 o'clock in the morning, Jesus was put on the cross. Now it's noon. It's been three hours since he's been on the cross. And at noon, this darkness fell over the whole area. And it lasted for three hours. I want us to understand that this wasn't some type of um, cloud cover. It wasn't some type where it was overcast. And darkness fell over to land. And I would think that, that at this point in time, I would also think there was a silence over the land. Something was going on. Something that, that, was, that was not foreseen. In the middle of the day, there was darkness over the land. I, I, I believe this was a, a, a spiritual darkness as well as a physical darkness. Uh, it, it seems that, ma that nature was, was mourning over the stark tra the, the tragedy of the death of, of God's son. I, I think this is where, you know, at the end of this darkness, is where that God turned his back on Jesus. It was then that Jesus took our sins. And, and this is where he cried out. You know, Jesus did not ask the question, why have I been forsaken? Out of, out of despair, he, he was quoting Psalms 22, uh, verse 1. This is when he became our sacrifice. This is when he became our propitiation. This is when he became our atonement for our sins. He knew at this point in time that he was going to be temporarily separated from God. He knew that his father could not look upon any sin whatsoever and that he had to turn his back from him. Habakkuk 113 says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look with favor on those who deal treacherously. God is a just and holy God, and he cannot be around sin. He cannot look upon sin. He will not be around sin. And this was the time, the separation that he turned, that Jesus took our sins. And it was the cup that Jesus dreaded as he prayed in Gethsemane. And we need to understand that, that even though that he was in a physical pain, I, I can imagine that this was a horrific pain. It, it was something that was excruciating. It was not nothing compared to the alienation he had from God when, when his father turned his back, when his, gut, when his father gave him the ultimate torture of not being there for him, that eternal separation. That's, what, that's, why, that's why he didn't want to go because he knew what he, what he had to do. The bystanders, they heard Jesus cry out, and they, was one, and they misunderstood his words because they thought that Elijah was going to come and ascend here and, 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 and get him off the cross. He was going to rescue him. He, see, Elijah was associated with, is associated with the final appearance of God, God's kingdom, and that Jesus was going to call for Elijah and then rescue him. And they really misinterpreted that, that. And I think people today are still confused about Jesus. And what he could do on the cross. Because people today, they don't want to make Jesus Lord of their lives. They, they want Jesus for what they can offer. They don't, want to, they don't want to make him Lord. And I think they're really confused about what it really takes to, to, to know Christ as the Lord of their life. And um, you just can't play at this. This is something you have to take serious. It's something that you have to, to walk the walk and talk the talk and, 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 and make Christ Lord of your life. But I kind of digress a little bit with that. I want to move on and, and go forward. In verses 37 through 41, it says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last breath, it said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There was also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the less, and Jose, and Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women 
who came up with him to Jerusalem. So, Jesus, Mark says that, that Jesus gave up a loud cry. And, and, and in John chapter 19, um, on verse 30, John says that loud cry was that he said, it is finished. That's what, that's what he, he proclaimed. That's, that's the climax in this horrible, this, this horrid scene. It's that Jesus says, it is finished. Jesus did not die a normal crucified death. Because most of the time, um, these things lasted two or three days, the crucifixion. They would, they would just um, basically suffocate to death. And once they would lose some oxygen, they would, they would pass out and they would die. But we see that Jesus gave his own life up. We see that, that, that he breathed his last. That he said, it is finished, it is done, and he gave his life up. He did not lapse into a coma. He was conscious the whole time. He was fully in control of what was going on. And he gave his life up. And, 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 and that's, what, that's what he did. He gave his life up. Now, there's really four miracles that happened when Jesus gave his life up. The first was the darkness that I talked about. And the second was the tearing of the veil. You know, there was the, the Holy of Holies, and only, only the high priest could go into this. It, it was the only way that anybody could, could have be with God like that. And that temple veil was torn when Jesus gave his life, up, his life up. He gave us that access. He gave us a way to God. And it was just symbolically saying, no longer can only certain people, but everyone can have access to God. You get to Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 and 52, and you see there's two different other um, miracles that happened. Earthquakes shook Jerusalem. That whole area was, was, was that. And, 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 and the greatest miracle, I think of all, is that dead people rose from their graves and started walking about. So we, there, was, there was those four miracles that happened, and, and we see that. So there was no way that anybody who was around that could, could, could look at that and say something significant had to happen. I mean, I think that centurion that was standing there saw all these things happening, and he looked upon, and he says, truly, this is the Son of God. Now, we don't know for sure if, if he knew exactly what he was saying, if he knew and meant, if he knew what those words really meant. But I think Mark uses those words because he kind of makes his gospel into a nutshell, which is just showing that, that, that Jesus truly was God's son. And he was the Messiah. And, and I think that Mark used that. And as the centurion said what he said, you know, you get at the cross and you see that, that there was a lot of people that, that, that were there to taunt him and do those type of things. And we talked a little bit about that last week. But there, Jesus had a lot of followers to, that were there. Um, all of his disciples had deserted, deserted him except for one, and it was John that was there. We, you go back to, once again, his gospel in chapter 19. We see that Jesus kind of had a conversation with John and saying, you, you take care of my mom. And John agreed that, that, that he would take care of his mother. And even though the disciples who, who made that great promise of loyalty were, were scattered, these women were there. And they waited at the cross. And they went to the tomb. You know, back in those days, women could not do anything. They, they, they could do very little. You know, they couldn't go to the Sanhedrin and speak on Jesus' behalf. They, they, they couldn't appeal to Pilate. They couldn't stand against the crowds. They couldn't overpower the Roman guards. But they did what they could. And they stayed at the cross when the disciples had fled. They followed Jesus' body to the tomb. They prepared the spices for his body. They used the opportunities they had. And we're going to see that they were the first to witness the resurrection. And God blessed their devotion and their diligence. You know, as believers, we need to take advantage of those opportunities that we have and we can for Christ instead of um, making excuses or worrying about what we cannot do. We're in the midst of this pandemic. We're, we're right in the middle of this. And I, and I think what a, what a wonderful opportunity that we have to further God's kingdom. Yet yeah, this this. This pandemic is something that's very serious and something that, that we have to take serious. But it's also something that we can, as Christ followers, as his disciples, to be able to, to step up and, and, and proclaim Christ to a dying world. To let them know that, that God is in control. You know, in Romans um, 8, 28, and it says, and, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good 
to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So, so we can use this. We can use this opportunity to proclaim his kingdom, to, to, to tell people about Christ and to do things for them. We've got a limited opportunity in this world to do things, and we need to take advantage of it. And so as we move on um, to, to finish up chapter 15, verses 42 through 47, it says, When evening had already come, because it was a preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Aramaeus came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time and summoned the centurion and he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And in searching this from the centurion, he granted the body of Joseph. And Joseph bought a line cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in the tomb where he had been hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jose, were looking on to see where, the, he, where he was laid. So the Sabbath always began on sundown on Friday. That was the Jewish law, and it lasted until sundown on Saturday. So that was the third Sabbath day. And the day before was always preparation day. It was the day they cooked all the meals. It was the day they did all the things. And, and then Sunday, they wasn't able to travel. They wasn't able to, to do any physical labor at all. And so um, they, they knew that. And, and Joseph of Aramaeus, um, as Mark here, um, also knew that, being part of the Jewish council, John mentions uh, Nicodemus was with um, Joseph of Aramaeus, and so it was Joseph and, and Nicodemus, and they were part of the, 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 the Sanhedrin. They were secret disciples, I guess is what you could call them, um, because they really couldn't um, stand up for Jesus because how bad the Jewish leaders hated Jesus, and, and so uh, they were kind of secret disciples because they didn't want to um, be um, known for that and they knew the, the 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 problems that it would cause. But man, I want you want us to see the boldness of these two men on how courageous they really were. You know, they, the disciples they, they scattered because they knew that that um they might be next. But these two men, they went to Pilate. And let me tell you what, this is why they were so bold. And when they went to Pilate, um, knowing that, that they needed to get Jesus' body down off the cross because of and they needed bury him because of, of the laws and stuff. And when they went to Pilate, Pilate could look at them as insurrectionists. Jesus was, was crucified because he was, quote, a terrorist, a, a somebody who, who, who had uprisings, and he was a threat to the throne. And, and so if somebody was going to go ask for the bodies, uh, then they could be looked upon as, as his followers and, and also been either thrown in jail or have the same fate. And, and Pilate... Basically, if you were crucified, they just took you and threw you in the dump. They didn't care about the body. And so Pilate really didn't have to give them the body. And he could have arrested them. And they were boldly, bold when they went to Pilate to, to ask for the body. The second thing is that their reputation was going to be shot. That they were, they were secret followers of Jesus in the Sanhedrin. Now, the religious, religious leaders knew that they were... That, uh, followers of Christ, and so they were no longer going to be able to to sit in the Sanhedrin and in that religious council, and the family probably would have turned their backs on them. But they knew what they had to do, and they boldly went and did what they had to do. You know, I think as Christians that we need to be that bold too. Too many times we're secret disciples. Too many times that that we um, that that we don't want anybody to know that that we're. Christian, we won't pray in front of people. We won't talk about Christ in front of people. Um, we're afraid of the, the repercussions of whatever it's going to be, and we cannot be that way. We need to stand up and tell the world of who Christ is, and we need to live our life accordingly and not try to be some type of secret disciple, but be boldly and, and go and tell people. And we see that they, as they went before Pilate, Pilate was really shocked at the fact that Jesus was already dead because he knew how long it took for, for people to die, and, and he was shocked about that. He called the centurion in, and the centurion told him, said, yes, Jesus is dead. I've been through many of these, and, and yes, he has died on the cross. And Pilate wanted to kind of, guess, maybe stick it to the religious leaders a little bit, said, yes, you can have the body. And they went, they took the body down, they wrapped it in, in, in linen and, and put the spices and all that, and they carried the body 
and they put it into the tomb. They rolled a stone, and the religious leaders made sure that they had guards on both sides, and they sealed the stone. They, they sealed the stone because they wanted nobody to steal Jesus' body. Okay, they, they didn't want anything to come of it. They didn't want the body to be stolen. Understand that there's no denying that, that, that Jesus' death was confirmed. It was confirmed by the centurion. It was confirmed by Pilate, by, by Joseph and Nicodemus. It was confirmed by, by John the apostle. It was confirmed by the women who witnessed his death and burial. And it was confirmed by the religious leaders. So we know that, that, that Jesus had died. And it looks like evil has won. It looks like Satan has got his way. It looks like the religious leaders had worn out. But we also know that Jesus' mission was not totally done yet. Yes, it was finished. He has taken our sins. But we know there's more to the story than that. We know that he is going to rise again. But as we look at, at, at Christ's death, there's really three things I want us to see what it meant for him to be hanging on that cross. Three things that, that, that really, as I was praying over this, that really just kind of came to me. And I want to see that, that there's three things that Christ's death is about. The first one, Christ's death was about love. It was about love. There's many ways of expressing your love. You can say it. You can give jewelry. You can, you can get flowers or candy. You can do thoughtful deeds. You can, you can do all kinds of things to express your love for somebody. You know, the kids, I, I love kids when they, when they um, write down things. And, and I, I ran across some, some words of, of children that, that, that how they thought that love is. And, um, here, here, here's what I, I found. I said, love is when someone hurts you and you get mad, but you don't yell at them because you know it would hurt their feelings. Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. Love is what is in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. Love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other for so long. Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than Robert Redford. Love is when your puppy licks your face, even after you let him alone all day. Sometimes kids are wiser than we are, aren't they? But God, God used many ways to express his love to, to us. Um, he expresses love in the pages of the Bible and scripture. He expresses love through the blessings that he gives us every single day. But the ultimate expression of love was displayed in sending his son, Jesus, for our sins. God expressed his love when, when Jesus went to the cross and he, and he died for our sins. And God's love was expressed with a, a sacrificial spirit. You know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whoever shall believe in him shall have everlasting life. Shall not perish. God loved us so much that he sent son. He gave us that sacrificial love. You know, John 15, 13 tells us, greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. What a sacrificial love. You know, you thought about that, and I, I think about this. Who would you lay your life down? I know I've asked this question before. I mean, definitely, I, I would lay my life down for family. There's no doubt about it that, that there's not anybody in my family who I would not lay my life down for. And friends, I I could say, yeah, I would probably lay my life down for my friends, you know, because I, I love them too. But what about a stranger? Where's that line drawn? You know, would you lay your life down for a stranger? How about an enemy? Certainly not an enemy, would you? Somebody who, who's done something to you, or maybe gossiped about you, or whatever the case may be, would you lay your life down for them? You see, Jesus went to the cross for each and every single one of us. When he was hanging there on the cross, he wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about us. He was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. He knew he was going to have pain and suffering, but he did not care. He knew he was going to die, but he still went because he loved Make no mistake about it. His death was about love. Second thing I want to see, Christ's death was about God. It was about God. God, 
Jesus was an extension of, of God's hand, honestly. That's, that's why he was here. He was 100% man, 100% God. He was, he was God wrapped and in, 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 in robed in our flesh. And, and God, God created us. He knew that we would stumble and fall. He knew we was going to make bad decisions. He knew we was going to need help along the way. And he extended his hand on our journey through Jesus Christ. You know, like I said, I can remember back in the day when my kids and my grandkids were growing up and I would hold their hands when we were out doing things, you know, and, and maybe like in a parking lot, um, I, I would hold their hand. But as they got a little older, they would reach up and want to hold my hand. And, and even though they thought maybe they were holding my hand, I was actually holding theirs because I was able to, to look and see if there was a danger. If we was in a parking lot, I could see if there was a car or somebody was coming up and I could kind of guide and direct them. And there's a lot of times when we reach our hand up for to hold God's hand. But, and honestly, God is holding our hand because he can guide us and direct us and, and, and lead us and, and give us places we want to, that, that he wants us to go to. There's a story that, that, I, that I tell. It's about this man who, one winter night, it was really cold, bitter cold, and, and his wife and daughter had gone to a church service, and he's sitting there, and he hears a racket outside, and, and he thinks about what's going on, and he looks out there, and he, and he, he sees these birds out in, the, out in the yard, and he says, man, these birds are going to freeze to death. And he looks at the barn, and he says, man, if I can get them in my barn, then I know they'll be okay. So he goes outside, he opens up the barn door, and he tries to get them to go in, and they just, they just scatter and come back, and he can't get the birds into the barn. He said, well, I put down some bird feed and some bread, and, and maybe I can get them in the barn that way, and they wouldn't do that. And, he, and he's kind of distraught about this, and he says, man, how can I get those birds in there? He says, if I was only a bird just for a few minutes, I could tell them where safety was. See, God came down to us to tell us where the safety was, and that's through Jesus Christ. It was from the very beginning. It, it, was, it was from the early on that God knew this. In John 1, 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness cannot comprehend it. So we see that, that, that in the beginning, God knew this plan. In the beginning, he knew that, that Jesus was going to have to go to the cross. And so this was God's plan. And make no mistake about it, it it's about Christ's death and resurrection. It, it was about God and what he planned because he knew what we needed. The last thing I want us to see is Christ's death was about creating a way to God. About creating a way to God. Jesus is the entryway to God. That is the only way I can, I can say that. Very simply, uh, it, it, it's just that way. Jesus said in 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And in John 10.9, it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the one that, that bridges that gap. In 1 Timothy 2.5, he says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Understand very simply, a mediator means he is our go-between. He is the one that, that's in between us and God. He is 100% man and 100% God. And he is the only one that, that, can, that, that can bridge that gap because we can't get to God by ourselves. We cannot, no way, any, any, any way, get to God. All of our good acts, we can, we can give money, we can do whatever. We can never do anything good enough to get to God. And Jesus bridges that gap. He, he, he creates us a way. He has two divine natures, one human and one God, and he gives us a way to be able to get to God. That is the way that he does it. That, that is what he is. That's what he did when he went on the cross. He, he gave us a way to God. Jesus is the fullness, and the fullness of his beauty and glory is the mediator of the new covenant. The, the Old Covenant, which is the law, the Ten Commandments, and all that stuff that we can never keep. You know, we're, we're told by James that, that if we break one, we break them all. We're told by Paul the same thing, that, that if we break one of the commandments, then we break all the commandments. And so there's no way we can keep those commandments. That's the Old Covenant. Jesus comes, and he's fulfillment of that Old Covenant. He is now the New Covenant, and he gives us a way 
because of our sinfulness, to cover, to be an atonement for our, for our sins and gives us the way to, to God. Jesus said, it is finished. He was saying that I have created a way for your sins to be forgiven so that you can have a way to my Father. That's what he did on the cross. So to wrap up, we have again considered uh, that when we look at this, this, this holy passage of scripture, we see that Jesus died in our place and during the judgment and the death that we deserved. He was there because he knew that there was his, that was his purpose for coming to this earth, to live on this earth, to, to, to live a sinless life, to be able to take our place, the, the, the punishment that we deserve. He knew that was his mission. He, he committed to fulfill this plan of redemption and this great love that he has for us and compel him to, compel him to endure the, the suffering and the pain on the cross to, to say it is finished was the triumphal shout of our Lord as he died on the cross for us. These words remind us that there's nothing that we can do ever to earn our salvation. It's all about Christ. It's everything that he did on that cross. The debt has been paid. Forgiveness is available to, to any and all of us. Nothing remains but to have faith in Christ, to, to turn to him, to, to, to repent of your sins, to confess him as Lord and Savior. When, we, when, you, when you do that, when you, when you turn him over to him and you repent, when you do the 180, when you walk towards him instead of towards the world, when you make him Lord of your life, when you believe what he did, then you will have that everlasting life and your sins will be forgiven and he will bridge that gap for us you have already done that, I rejoice with you today. But if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day that, that, that you make him Lord of your life. I, I would say come to me after church, but, but you know how to get a hold of me. And, and if you ever need to talk, that I will be here to, to talk about that. New life, eternal life is available to us. It begins the moment that we come to the cross and receive Christ. And we trust in him as our personal Lord and Savior. Please pray with me. Lord, Heavenly Father, I just thank you once again for everything you do. And I thank you for these words. I thank you for your son who went to the cross, who died for our sins, who took our punishment, our death. And Lord, I'm just so grateful for the love that he has for each and every single one of us. And Lord, I'm just so grateful that he has created a way where I can, I can come to you, Father. Once again, God, it's all about you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.